Okay, good morning. And uh, welcome to this first panel. Uh, you see Thierry is very careful to say first panel rather than opening panel. Uh, this panel is, going, is called Geoeconomics and Development in a Fragmented World. And uh, in, the, in light of the, the, the comments you were just making to start us off, it's a very good topic with which to get started. We have a, a great panel. Now, let me just say a couple of things to get us started, if I may. Uh, international development and politics, international politics, geopolitics have always been connected. So it's not as if this is something new. The question I think we will explore in this panel is how the relationship is changing and what that means for the way in which we think about development, we think about development cooperation. And uh, I'd like to propose that there are at least three ways in which that relationship is changing. First, we used to think about international development mainly as how to improve living standards, how to deal with poverty within individual countries. So it was a country-based approach to thinking about issues. Today, we think about international development much more as a set of global challenges, which include climate change, pandemics, uh, biodiversity. And while these overlay with countries, the way we think about them has become uh, broader and different. Secondly, because we are thinking about these broader challenges, we can no longer, when we think about development cooperation, simply have the development agency or the development ministry in, in a uh, rich country deal with their share of how to support development. Now, every ministry, every agency, whether it's the financial sector, and the role that it plays, whether it's the health ministries around the world, everybody needs to cooperate to be able to deal with global challenges, much more so than was the case before. And finally, third, even though the need for cooperation is broader to solve these shared challenges, the possibilities of cooperation, the scope for cooperation, is becoming more constrained because of the fragmentation in the way in which global politics is, uh, uh, is organized now and the rivalry amongst great powers. And so we will explore, I hope, all of those issues during this panel. And uh, what I'd like to do, if I may, is to start, first of all, with uh, Amina Touré, because uh, she brings a, a perspective of having thought about these issues uh, and dealt with them in different ways uh, in, in Senegal. And so, uh, Madame Touré, if I could start with you, and then we'll go further. Thank you very much. Well, it's always a pleasure to be here. Um, so, we're talking about a fragmented world. Um, I think societies themselves are fragmented, whether you're from a wealthy country or less wealthy country. And that's the first thing that we need to acknowledge, that even in wealthy country, you do have people who feel left um, you know, on, the, on, on, on the side. Uh, internationally, when we talk about uh, international development, we have to reshuffle our concept. Um, theoretically, China is supposed to still be a developing country, by the way. <laughs> which I think doesn't uh, meet the criteria. Um, to say that um, we live in a world where we really need to uh, stop and maybe offer a new, new length um, to analyze it. Um, I think there is um, sort of a, a, a history in the making, uh, in a painful way most of the time. But what we are witnessing from where I'm sitting, which is Africa, uh, let's remember that it's 54 countries. It's, a, it's, a, it's an important grouping. Um, that's where uh, maybe the, the future of nutrition 
will be decided because you do have 60% uh, of available land. Um, you do have the youngest um, population in the world. You have huge resources. Um, so you cannot talk about the future without having a deep analysis about what's going on in Africa. And what is going on in Africa is sort of a, a, a mixture of um, concern first, of course. Um, I'm from West Africa, concern about security. Um, and we know what's going on in the Sahel, what happened between um, the former colonial power but became a partner and the relationship is not necessarily going well in, in Mali and Niger and Chad. Um, you do have new generation coming to power in you know, questionable ways for sure, but they are there. And how are we going to um, sort of make sure that we do have international development uh, along the side of international institution that works and partners who trust themselves? Because I think we are in a mix of a trust crisis uh, among international partners, among countries who were under um, you know, colonial um, sort of power and moved on 60 years down the line, developing different relationships. Some people are saying, well, it's not that different between you know, Africa and its uh, former partners. So I think there is also from the other um, side, um, a, a new way of looking at things. And secondly, we do have, as I said, the youngest population in the world. Um, so how are you going to make sure that that population is uh, more of an asset rather than um, a, a, a liability? Because liability also concern our partners with international migrations and, uh, and even securities and all these things. So I think what we really need to think about is what could be the solutions to make sure that we converge uh, you know, together and we define a civilized world. Um, first of all, I think we have to think about the United Nations that is weaker and weaker. Um, international cooperation is uh, occurring outside of uh, the United Nations that is still um, uh, struggling to find even funding. We saw how, sorry to say, little relevant they have been in the Ukraine crisis, for instance, but in other crises too. Um, you know, I was talking about the Sahel and other places, but I think we need to give stronger teeth um, to the United Nations first. Second, I think we need to open up uh, the leadership. As we speak, I say, talk about 54 countries, African countries, and no permanent seat. That doesn't make sense to me. Um, you know, taking into consideration what I said before. So second, um, making sure that an important part of the world is part of the Security Council. Um, I think we need to redefine relationship between former colonial powers and um, current developing countries. Um, I, for instance, acknowledging what happened, uh, you know, across history, um, and maybe trying to make it right. Um, I see that in some countries, uh, you know, after the uh, the, 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 the the Johnson um, um, events two years back, that many countries are looking into their colonial history and trying to sort of make it right, as I said. Um, and also having a genuine uh, international cooperation, which means that we're gonna look uh, genuinely into, um, into young people's rights, into women's rights, um, and we're gonna make sure that on a solidarity basis, we are going together to define um, common goals and accomplish it, which means also that countries uh, who pledge uh, financially uh, should come to the, to the pot, which is not the case. And of course, you cannot talk about fragmented, um, a, a fragmented world without talking about climate change. Um, we have hopes that after Charles Cher, we will really, really, really see genuine genuine uh, movement uh, toward making um, sort of uh, the financial pledges a reality. So that's what I wanted to say at this point. Um, let's look into the solution because the problem, we know them. And we saw the solution. We, we saw the, the, the problem, we know them. So now we should focus on the solution. And the solution for me is a more 
um, unified visions, uh, putting human being at the center. Uh, and I know we have a lot of people coming from the, um, from the private sector, which is important. And I think private sector should look again in today's practices, because you only do business when you have peace, uh, when, you have, when you don't have unrest, when you have consumers who are healthy, um, because nobody's made doing business in, in Ukraine anyway, uh, or in many other places um, uh, that we don't talk about. That brings also the issue of forgotten conflicts um, that goes over time, and the, sent and the, the feeling that um, you know, it depends on where you sit on the planet for your conflict right. um, to be recognized and solution uh, brought up for peace to come back. So I think it brings back the whole issue, common issue of women, of human rights. We are all human fellows. Um, so we have a common planet that we want to work and live in and be loved and <laughs> etc. So maybe if we go, we start by the end, uh, we may find ways to converge. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, for starting us off. And, and thank you for saying that you know, maybe we've described the problem often enough, but we need to focus on what are the ways not just to define the solutions, but also to make the bridge to the solutions. How do we create the conditions so that the solutions actually become uh, real? So one issue that uh, has been raised in this is that we're moving from the globalization to, to deglobalization and or some form of uh, reglobalization. And uh, Jean-Marie Fogham, you are the WTO. You've been looking at these issues. You're right in the center of it. Can you give us a little bit your sense of what's actually been happening in this uh, phase? What are the facts we're telling us? And how do you see the process moving forward? Well, thank you, Masoud, and uh, good morning, everyone. I think your microphone is not yet on, but hopefully it will be. Can, can you hear me or? No? Okay. Ah, voila. Uh, I was saying thank you, Masoud, and good morning, everyone. I need to see what I do that. On, on, your, on your first question, um, what do we see? We, we don't really see deglobalization in the, in the figures, at least in the trade figures. I'm leaving aside investment or, or, or finance. Uh, of course, there are uh, trends which have been observed like uh, an apparent slowdown of the rate of openness that is trade uh, uh, over GDP. But it can be explained by many statistical phenomena such as the va va variations in, uh, in the commodity prices or uh, also the compositions of the GDP which is more led by services while trade is more led by goods. So there is not uh, really the feeling that there is a structural ebbing of globalization as far as trade is, uh, is concerned. There is also a slowing down of trade in the second half of the, uh, uh, the, the, the decade, uh, which probably has to do with some uh, maturity of the value chains uh, development. There is a, a sort of plateau. But here again, we don't see that moving back toward uh, a reduction of, uh, of the contribution of world trade to GDP. What is happening is, yes, that there are new forces which are going to shape this globalization and make it probably more complex and generate more uh, transaction costs for businesses and, uh, <clears throat> and also for government. And uh, there are three of those which are really clear. Uh, the first one is, of course, the, the return of uh, what we may call generically strategic trade policies, which has to do with industrial policy. And this is very, very documented now. We see a lot of uh, increasing of the intervention of the states to create comparative advantages. This has to do with the Cheap and Science Act in the US or the Inflation Reduction Act. The uh, projects of common European interest in Europe of course, China 2025, and also in Japan there are some, some of these. So it's quite documented at the OECD. You see at least, for instance, the level of subsidies, government subsidies increasing. That's one. Uh, second one is what uh, I may call n quite naturally uh, decoupling policies, which involve a, a vast array of policies, from the worst, which is the war and sanctions, to the least, or oh, just the second one, the trade war, basically the one which has been unleashed by President Trump against China, or the softer concept of open strategic autonomy. You don't know exactly what is lying there. But there is this idea that uh, you will have a world shaped, uh, a world market will be shaped by a lot of 
politics. And if you take, for instance, sanctions, uh, uh, the, the sanctions, it was not really a systemic issue when it was dealing with small economies, if I may call like them like that. But when you are dealing with the 11th world economy like Russia, then you see that there is uh, the beginning of a global impact. Uh, <clears throat> and also recently in Brussels there was a, a forum on export control and uh, the figures were, were astonishing because, uh, for instance, for the UK, it's uh, minus 97% uh, uh, of export towards Russia and closely uh, the same for for the EU. So this decoupling is, a, a, is quite a new trend. We have been modeling that in the WTO, imagining a world just like in the old days, uh, separated in two blocks, and that would mean, according to our economists, uh, a reduction of GDP, of overall GDP in the long term of 5%. And the third trend, of course, is decarbonization. Uh, and we, we know that when it comes to uh, net zero strategies, different countries and players are adopting different strategies. For instance, the, uh, to put the price on carbon, the EU has been cho choosing a market, uh, exchange of uh, emission permit, others are choosing taxes, uh, others are, are moving toward uh, regulations like the US. So you do not have an equivalence of that, and it's even worse when you try to start measuring carbon. Just take uh, the steel sector, which is representing more or less 8% of the uh, global emissions, you already have more than 20 standards measurements uh, in the world. So these are trends which are going to make it more uh, complex. Are our institution for international cooperation capable of dealing with that? Well, we in the WTO, we have been buried buried so, so many times that I think, uh, I think uh, even this morning I heard that uh, we, we, we were already dead, but I don't think so. Uh, we have a, a quite uh, a mixed situation. The first one is that there is a quite a reasonably strong capital about the core principles which are articulating the world trading system. These are transparency, good faith, <clears throat> and non-discrimination. And you do not see radical contestations or radical dispute over those principles, even in a worse situation like uh, the, uh, the one with the, the Trump administration, nobody has been walking out of the WTO. So you don't see really disagreement on the fact that we can cooperate on this basis. And in fact, we, all, uh, we, we even had some uh, successes uh, this year. I may come back to it. What we face and we are confronted with is uh, several trends which all the institutionals are dealing, institutions are dealing with. Um, the first one is obviously the divergences in values and the uh, and, uh, government uh, systems, which translate into difficulties in the negotiation. The second one has to do with the, the how do we manage commons and the legacy for commons. This is very, the, the very big debate over climate change, but in the WTO we faced it also on the negotiation on fisheries. Uh, about the pro prohibition of uh, fisheries, which were of subsidies, which were contributing to overfishing, and then you have developing countries saying, "Guys, why should I uh, restrain my, the development of my fisheries? Why you have been taking all the fish historically?" So this is a really uh, um, complicated. Uh, the, these legacy issues are complicating the negotiation, and they are, they are very hard to cope. And of course, there is a difference in capacities uh, to, to tackle with uh, new trends of decarbonization and digitalization. So I think we will do some stop and go. We will have some successes in emergency circumstances. For instance, regarding the, the how to cope with the food crisis today, I think that if I look at the half empty glass, the response of global institution is quite reasonable, to a certain extent effective. I'm not saying that we are off the hook. It's a very difficult situation, but there is an, an answer. And in many cases, we will just face stalemates um, on, on, on core issues. So we'll have to deal with that, but do not throw the, um, the, the, the baby with the bus water. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for talking about the trends. Also raising this question, which I think we will come back to maybe even in the next panel, which is, are the institutions that were created, many of them going back 75, 80 years now, up to the job of dealing with the trends and issues that they are now being forced to deal with, and also do the main shareholders, members of these institutions, have confidence in them? Because what I find quite interesting to look at is that all the heads of institutions are busy defending themselves against their own shareholders uh, more and more, who are busy criticizing uh, what they are doing, and that's a, that's a difficult situation in which to find yourself. Um, 
Now, let, I, I do want to go next to uh, Kim Hung Chong. Kim, Kim um, I mean, Atatouré and also uh, Jean-Marie have talked about climate and the financing of global public goods. And one of the issues <coughs> on the table is how do we deal with the financing of global public goods, uh, which are clearly under finance. And I know you've been thinking about this. You want to talk a bit about that issue. Uh, what's your take on, on this? Okay. Uh, thank you for, first of all, thank you for the having me. Uh, this is very, uh, very meaningful I mean, the, uh, venue. And then I'd like to talk about the, uh, the where, uh, what kind of world we are living. Because the, uh, now, uh, I was in, in Moscow the last week of the, uh, the October, and I was surrounded by the, uh, the many scholars uh, who have a quite, a very, quite a different uh, way of thinking uh, compared to the, uh, the participants here. And then we talked about the many things about the global governance. Uh, last night, I, when I was arrived here, uh, I had to look at the, uh, the <coughs> title, the global governance. And then in Baldai, uh, they try to talk about the, uh, the many issues that um, now the world can be uh, going on uh, without any global governance. And what the, uh, the global governance they mean is that, um, you know, uh, a kind of the, uh, the platform or existing uh, order uh, the, that was established since the, uh, the Second World War. So, what I recognized, I mean, uh, while I was there, was that um, there are big differences, big contrast uh, between two group of people, how to understand the contemporary world. So we are now uh, f observing the big chasm, I mean, big chasm uh, between the two groups of people. And so this kind of fragmentation and the block civilization uh, is now very, very uh, substantial as we recognize. And then second, uh, we are now uh, facing the very rapid transformation, great transformation like the digitalization and then also you know, green transformation. And also we have uh, the unforeseen you know, the events like the uh, pandemic and the war. So all of these kind of things uh, make the, uh, uh, our the existing world uh, to create the, uh, the global public goods. So now we are now getting more difficult in creating all of these the, the global uh, public goods, which the, uh, the many developing countries and the underdeveloped countries uh, can develop and grow uh, based on the, uh, this kind of the, the platform or the existing order. And then I think that is one of the main reasons why the, uh, we are now suffering from the, uh, providing a proper level of the uh, global public goods. So uh, when it comes to the international development or uh, overseas development assistance, also we are now combating uh, the poverty and then global health crisis and also digitalize the side effect of digitalization, also the climate crisis. All of things uh, can be contributing to the, uh, uh, the big change of the structure of the ODA now. And this can uh, be, uh, on the one thing, I mean, this is the kind of the, uh, the now the supporting, uh, the widening, I mean, uh, the, the you know, income disparities among the peoples, uh, but also it can contribute to uh, the creating uh, global public goods in terms of the, uh, the ODA ramification. So I think that now the, uh, we are now facing uh, in, in a uh, moment of the, uh, the uh, revolutionizing our structure of the, uh, the ODA uh, towards the, uh, the new uh, direction of the, uh, the providing uh, more global public goods uh, through the uh, digitalization, through uh, the climate uh, crisis, combating against the climate crisis and then, and then digitalization and then green uh, uh, technology. Many people would think that um, they w what's, what's the problem with the digitalization? But digitalization create has, has destroyed uh, middle-skilled middle workers. 
middle scale workers job was destroyed because of digitalization. So only un, very, a small amount of the unskilled and then high skilled can survive under the uh, digitalization. So we need to think about uh, these issues uh, when we are applying the, our ODA project to the developing countries. And also green technology as well. Green technology also, uh, most of the green technology is developed uh, in the advanced countries because the reason is, of course, I mean, the developing the green technology in the advanced country is, I mean, uh, kind of the, the very market oriented. So they can make money uh, by developing the, uh, this green technology. But that kind of environment that cannot be provided in the, uh, the least uh, developed countries. So all of these kind of big changes, uh, uh, together with the, uh, the pandemic and then uh, the war and bipolarization, all of things uh, are target for the, uh, the ODA. And also, I think that um, to provide the, the more public uh, global goods, uh, then the, the strengthening of ODA and then changing the structure of the ODA is now very, very important. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you for uh, bringing the question of the uh, development assistance, ODA, and how it's being used now. And if you, as, as you say, if you look at aggregate numbers for ODA, they're now about 180 billion or so. They've gone up a little bit over the last uh, few years. But most of this increase is accounted for by increase in humanitarian assistance and by increase in including the financing of refugees inside the country that is providing the assistance. So the largest recipient of Swedish ODA today is Sweden. The largest recipient of UK ODA today is the UK, <laughs> because that is where they're spending the largest share of their overseas assistance right now. Um, and also global public goods. So many developing countries are raising the question of whether, in fact, we are shortchanging the traditional development agenda by using the same limited pot of ODA for these other uh, equally important but different purposes. Um, that, of course, was part of the conversation in Sharm el Sheikh. It's been a lot of the discussion in the uh, way in which you can mobilize private capital. Bertrand, you have been thinking, Bertrand Badre, you have been thinking about it, acting on these issues for many years. I know you have been recently talking about the outcome of Sharm el Sheikh as well in this. I want to get a little bit your sense on where the debate stands and, and where you think the challenges lie in terms of making progress. Coming back to Aminata's first suggestion that we start <laughs> looking at how to move to the solutions. Well, so <coughs> so thank you, Masood, and it's great to be here. Thank you, Thierry. Um, yes, it's, uh, we, we discussed that last year already. I think the waters are more troubled even than they were last year, as, as you rightly said in your opening remarks, Thierry. Uh, we are at the moment where, on the one end, we have a, a con there's a convergence of traditional crises, economic crisis, social crisis, energy crisis, etc., and also an underlying transformation of many things. And the combination of this crisis and transformation is pretty difficult to handle. Transformation are geopolitical, I mean, the decarbonization of our economy, what's being discussed in Montreal starting today on biodiversity. Uh, of course, there's a technological changes and AI. I mean, all these things are, are, are making this puzzle a little bit difficult <coughs> to apprehend. Uh, on top of that, we have, and this is really what matters in what you said, this uh, growing tension between, I would say, the north and the south, or maybe the west and the south. Let me put it this way. Uh, we've seen that with the vaccines. We've seen that with the de debate on, on you, you know this, Madame Touré, on the gas in Africa. Uh, two years ago, it was bad to finance gas. Now we have a little gas problem, so we turn back to Africa and say, maybe we should reopen the door. Um, we, we have also these tensions on demography. On the one hand, we have this demographic push. We are an aging world, and uh, I've read some papers on the uh, Europe, European demography and the needs to open to, to migrations, and on the other hand, people don't want migrations. So all this makes this a, a little bit difficult. On top of that, you have what Mr. Macron has called the two elephants. You have the China and, uh, and the US, which are two elephants fighting each other, and they don't care about what's around the elephants. So we, we are in a world where on top of that, and this is really a concern to me, we, we are trying to develop a new sets of norms and standards, and in particular seen from Europe, 
uh, we develop everything which is connected to ESG and impact and, and, and a new way uh, to discuss sustainable finance, sustainable investment, which I think is, is well intentioned and I, I've, I've been supporting that for ages, but which, which is also uh, increasing the gap between several parts of the world. Sometimes when I want to be provocative, I say, I don't want Europe to become Boboland, you know, where we're very nice and cozy between us and we explain to the rest of the world, you should do like us. But it's not working this way. And so that's, that's really where, where, where I want to come from, to come to your questions. Uh, and all of this is also in, in at a moment where I believe, and it's, it's, uh, Jean-Marie tried to mitigate my, my, my feeling, that a lot of people are less and less concerned about what's happening far from them. Uh, m maybe some of you will remember the, the short novel from Voltaire, Candide, uh, 300 years ago, uh, or 250 years ago, uh, which ends by, we have to cultivate our garden. <laughs> uh, and people, I think, read this literally today. My garden, I mean, the world is too complex. Climate's too big, refugees too big, cybersecurity too big. I, I just can't handle this, so I'm taking care of my garden, literally understood, you know, with fences. And if I do take care of my garden, the world will be okay. The problem is that I think both Voltaire and us today should not think about the garden as a closed, ring-fenced area, but as our planet. And how do we move from the garden to the planet and back and forth? And that's, that's really where we are today. And I think it's, it's very difficult, including from a private sector perspective, because now your garden is yielding more money. Two years ago, when you put your money at home, you got zero. Now you got 4%. So why should I go to mm. Africa if I can get 4% at home? So everything is converging uh, in that direction. So I think we, are, we have to really uh, take into account the number of avenues to explore, and, and, and the sooner the better. And that's probably what President Macron has in mind when he's convening this summit in June on resetting the relationship with the Global South. I think there is one avenue which has been discussed for ages, and uh, you, you mentioned it, which is uh, the Security Council, the Bretton Woods system, etc. I mean, of course, it must be discussed, and as French, we probably have more to lose than others. Uh, I think it's difficult, but it's, it needs to be put on the table, definitely. Then we, we also have to put on the table the use of uh, new financing. I mean, you've, you've mentioned, you've entered at the SDR. Uh, what can we do with the SDR? This is real money that can be created and distributed and leveraged accordingly. Uh, and this is taking time, it's difficult, but we have to put this on the table. We also have to look at the IDA. Uh, IDA is, is a concessional money from the World Bank Group. Uh, we need to do more. I've tried when I was there to do more. We can leverage IDA. There are hundreds of billions which are available there, provided we show a little bit of courage and in, uh, imagination. We have, and I've said this many times, we have to have the development institutions work together as a system. Everybody is working in its silos. They don't want to cooperate. They compete with each other, let's face it. So here again, it's not so much the shareholders and the institution, it's a system together. So I think we have ample resources at, at, our, at our hands that we don't use for, for a number of, of reasons. So I think this is more, more act actionable than to just say, let's reform Bretton Woods. There is money that we can mobilize. I think, and, and maybe Maurice you will remember that, uh, 20 years ago with President Chirac, we work on new innovative mechanism. President Chirac had a good formula, he said, globalization should pay for globalization. I think it's, it's a way, and this, we, we created 20 years ago the tax on plane tickets to finance unit aid, medical research. I think we have to find new global resources. That's a nice way to uni unite people. Maybe it, it, it's a tax, and I know when French people so speak about tax, they, it's always <laughs> suspicious. Uh, <laughs> but maybe tax on extractive, uh, extractive industries, maybe tax on carbon. I, I have no idea. But find some things that put us in the same boat and that, that guarantees some flow of money over the years, not dependent on, on the will of parliaments year after year after year. So I think we have to work in that direction. And that's probably also a way uh, to work on global public goods as well. I think we, we also have to uh, develop new instruments. I mean, you mentioned some of them. Uh, the, the question is not to, to, to move money from one pot to the other with the same amount of money. But I think we have to redesign uh, our, our ODA in an appropriate manner. I mean, we, we talk about uh, public goods, we don't do much about this, and it's true that if you tell the, the development institution, oh, you have to finance public goods, they will take money out of the bilateral aid to public goods, and then people will be angry, and, uh, and rightly so. 
And, and then comes the mobilization of the private sector, which is extremely dear to my heart. It's more and more difficult because precisely of the, what I mentioned, the financial conditions have changed. The interest of people has changed. They are less interested in emerging market and developing economies. It's more risky. It's far away. My, um, some people told me my clients don't want their money to be sent so far away. They want their money to be used in France, in the US, America first. That is true. So how do we, do, do we really find a way to mobilize? And I think it's, it's now the time to address all types of issues which have been known for ages. I mean, I've, I've participated to hundreds of panels on mobilizing private money, on blended finance, on public-private cooperation. We know all the solutions, so we don't need another one, but we really need to say, okay, what are the technical obstacles? I mean, there are technical obstacles regarding the definition of ODA. How do you take into account guarantees? Guarantees are not taken into account in ODA, and, and, and we need, I mean, with guarantees you can leverage more money than by direct transfer. That, that's again, I don't want to be boring, but that's one, one idea. You have to do look at uh, the Basel III constraints, you have to look at the Solvency II constraints, you have to take them one by one, what are the obstacles? And then you have to really make a push, the cultural issue. It is important, we will not win the climate battle in Paris, Brussels or Washington. We will win the climate battle in Lagos, Delhi and Bogota. So if we want to get that battle won, we have to transfer the money and the skills, etc. If we don't do it, we're going to lose it. That's what I call the, the billion children. We have to really shift the needle and go in, in that direction. I think it's extremely important. Uh, and we have also to make sure that the, the, the development institutions agree that the key uh, the, the way they should be incentivized, the way they should be assessed is, do they mobilize private money? It is not the case today. It's still marginal. And, and we really have to change that. If we don't change that, private money will not move. Let's face it, there is no incentive whatsoever to move in, in scalable manner. So I think, I don't think uh, we will have a revolution. I think we need a revolution. Uh, that's again my French flavor. Uh, <laughs> I don't think we'll get it, let's face it. We will not reform Bretton Woods this year. We will not find the, the magic system to mobilize private sector. But I think we need a serious evolution. We need to really be serious about this. I'm, I'm really tired of fooling myself with all these conversations. We say, yeah, we should do that, we should do that. And so little is changing. Uh, I, I think, again, we will not find a way to, to, to calm the waters. Uh, but if we can find a way to use a song, to build a bridge over the troubled water, <laughs> that would be good enough. Thank you. Very good. So now we have the garden, which we thought we could protect, but actually, as you say, unfortunately, no matter how much you tend your own garden, the forces that are impacting it are global. Uh, and you've identified, Bertrand, a number of technical things could be done. You mentioned SDRs uh, about Two years ago, there was, as many of you know, a big allocation of new SDR, $650 billion. And this is a really remarkable achievement in the middle of the pandemic. Uh, and there was a, dis a big effort to say that apart from the initial allocation, a lot of the SDRs, uh, more than two thirds, went to countries that didn't really need them, rich countries, and they should recycle these SDRs. They should find ways to uh, provide these SDRs to countries that needed the money. And many mechanisms were discussed. Here we are two years later. And the fact of the matter is that while some of those SDRs have moved from the central banks of rich countries to the account of the IMF, not a single SDR has yet reached any poor country two years later. So we have just had a big conversation and a moving of numbers across accounts, but so far no real transfer has taken place. And, and I think what that brings us to is the last two interventions, I hope we'll focus on it, is all this that you're talking about, that the other panelists were talking about, requires cooperation. And yet, cooperation right now is in short supply particularly uh, because of the rivalry, and I think it is, it's gone beyond competition to being rivalry between the US and, uh, and some of its allies increasingly and China. And of course, developing countries find themselves caught between this and are hoping that they can stay out of this and, and have good relationships with everyone. But is that feasible uh, going forward? So I want to turn first to 
Jeff Frieden to get your perspective on this, and then I'm going to come to Vincent, who's been studying sort of the evolution in China. So, Jeff, over to you. Right. Well, thank you very much. Um, I think I appreciate Madame Touré's uh, reminding us of the importance of understanding the divisions within countries and the legitimate concerns of, of those, but, but at your suggestion, Masood, I think I want to focus on the geoeconomic and political situation and the constraints that that imposes, and I'm afraid I am pessimistic on many of these dimensions, keeping in mind, of course, that a pessimist is just a well-informed optimist, so I think I'm being realistic about the, 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 the possibilities. And as we all know, there we are in the midst of, I think, a fundamental change in the kinds of constraints and opportunities faced by developing countries as the world has evolved. Uh, these, this is going to be a very, very challenging period to come. The last couple of decades, we've gotten used to cheap money in plentiful quantities with the search for yield and very low interest rates, negative real interest rates, um, very high commodity prices in general with some commodity booms in the period, and, and relatively open trade. And I guess I would just point out that all of those are changing. We confront a period of, a sustained period of high interest rates and of, uh, of economic and financial conditions that are drawing capital back to the developed world, out of the developing world. There is a global growth slowdown, including in China, which I think portends generally weaker commodity prices throughout the world. Um, there are, perhaps most important, greater and greater limits on trade coming from the OECD, from the developed countries. Traditional protectionism, but more important now, concern about the domestic production of essential commodities, of essential goods, whether out of the pandemic or out of national security considerations. Um, there, is, uh, there are greater limits associated with climate policy, with border, border adjustment mechanisms being designed in country after country that will be serious constraints on the developing world's ability to access the markets of the developed world. Um, there uh, is the increasing likelihood and reality of tying trade more and more to, uh, to human rights, labor rights, democracy, and climate policy, um, all of which, uh, again, are constraints being imposed by the developed world. And that doesn't even mention, with due respect, the continuing American campaign to destroy the WTO. So all of this, I think, portends much more difficult access to OECD markets on the part of developing countries, and often many access which often is and will continue to be contingent on satisfying some quite stringent economic and political requirements that will be politically very difficult and economically very difficult for, for many uh, poor countries around the world. So are there alternatives? Well, there's China with the Belt and Road Initiative, with the Chinese development banks and development projects. But as was pointed out, China is in many ways still a developing country, a very, very large developing country. But I think many are finding that, as is true of virtually all of these relationships, <clears throat> money comes with strings attached. It's not free money. Chinese contractors, technology, workers, and geopolitical strings as well in terms of pi policy towards Taiwan. And more importantly, I think that the, the ability of China to, to stand as a true replacement for or alternative to the OECD is strictly limited simply by the level of development in China and the size of the Chinese economy. So there are some opportunities there, but in no way can China be seen as a replacement to the OECD in supplying capital technology markets for the development process. The Russian axis, which sometimes is pointed at as an alternative, I think is, is increasingly disappearing into the horizon as the Russian government gallops down the path to making Russia a pariah state. Um, this is essentially, I think, going to continue and deepen as the conflict with the West turns into a new Cold War. The relevant consideration here is that not only do we have a sanctions regime in place and, and being put in place, but those sanctions are going to become more and more stringent. There will be secondary and tertiary sanctions that will make it extremely difficult for countries to maintain economic ties or to deepen economic ties with Russia and its allies. So the, the, the broader impact of a new Cold War, I think, will be severe and, and serious. Um, so all in all, this is a very challenging period. The developed countries have been placing and will continue to place greater and greater demands on 
the economic and political uh, uh, realities of the, the developing world and the emerging markets, whether they are economic, political, or geopolitical, meaning that there will be some very, very difficult choices to, to be made. The, developing wor wor the developed world, the OECD, is, in, incre is and will continue to be increasingly stringent in the kinds of demands that it places on the developing countries. Um, there are no easy alternatives available, so I think all in all, this is going to be a very, very challenging time for the developing world and for the prospects of development. I should say that I appreciate the kinds of alternatives or mechanism design issues that have been discussed here, but as Masood, uh, I think, uh, alluded to, <clears throat> the, ability, the willingness and ability to design and implement those changes depends on the underlying domestic political and geopolitical realities, especially in the OECD, and I am pessimistic about the possibility of moving fast in that direction. I think we have to be realistic about what is reasonable to expect given the very, very difficult domestic political con uh, circumstances that we haven't really talked about within many of the developing, uh, of the developed, developed countries. And in that context, I think that rea realism would be a better uh, state of mind in thinking about the way forward and the realities are extremely challenging on every dimension. Thank you very much. Jeff, thank you for sort of bringing in sort of, uh, you know, that perspective that things are going to be quite difficult. And uh, also linking it right back to the first comment, which is that the fragmentation and the realities within countries are driving a lot of the international uh, relations. I want to end up with going to Vincent. Uh, so China's been the big driver of global growth. It's become the largest lender to developing countries. It's a big market for them. Um, it's invested through the Belt and Road Initiatives. But now, as Jeff pointed out, you know, Chinese economic growth slowing down dramatically. Maybe for the next few years, we're going to actually have to get used to a China that is not growing at 8 or 10 percent a year on average, but about half that. Uh, there's a lot of internal imbalances, housing market, financial sector need to be sorted out. There's some pulling back on the Belt and Road. From your perspective, I know, Vincent, you've been doing, uh, from the OECD, country studies, and you've looked at China. What's your take on what that means for the process of the relationship with the developing countries and the engagement of China in global processes, including on climate change? Uh, thank you, Masood, and uh, thank you to Mr. Montreal and uh, Song Min Kim. Uh, I um, am very reassured by Professor Frieden's statement that the uh, OECD will not be replaced by China anytime soon. <laughs> As uh, the OECD uh, person here, uh, that's, uh, that's nice to hear, <laughs> and I agree. Uh, my last trip to China um, shortly before uh, the uh, COVID uh, raised its, its ugly head in, in Wuhan was in, in late 2019, when China was celebrating four decades of uh, convergence towards uh, uh, advanced uh, economies. Uh, to give you one number, uh, GDP per capita uh, in China uh, was 3% of the G7 average in the late 70s, and it rose to 36% of the OECD average by the late 2010s. This is a, an amazing takeoff that only Korea <laughs> and uh, a couple of other countries uh, managed to, to achieve uh, earlier on. Um, in the process, poverty was reduced dramatically. Uh, living standards increased a lot. And uh, in 2019, we were celebrating the, the China dream, uh, with China uh, having overtaken the US a few years earlier in terms of absolute size, in PPP terms. Uh, and. Uh, we were talking about how China would project uh, its might across the, the globe through the Belt and Road Initiative, which was mentioned uh, several times. Uh, and uh, then the pandemic stepped in, uh, which uh, initially uh, w was uh, managed uh, quite effectively, in a sense, by, by China. But, but then, uh, uh, as we have seen in, in recent days, uh, uh, three years of confinement, of, of repeated lockdowns, uh, and of, of low growth uh, have taken their toll, and uh, Chinese leaders are um, 
obsessed by two things. One is uh, growth and the other is uh, social stability. And uh, both were at risk uh, uh, with the, the way uh, China tried to manage uh, this pandemic. Uh, uh, it's sort of an impossible trinity that they were after uh, to have at the same time uh, maintained uh, social stability, growth and low casualties. This was not sustainable over time, especially with uh, fairly ineffective uh, Sinovac and Sinopharm vaccines. Uh, there's a recent article in The Lancet just uh, 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 a few weeks ago that documents uh, that uh, the effectiveness of the Chinese uh, vaccines is much less than that of the RMNA vaccines developed in the West. And China's unwillingness to use the more effective vaccines is, is quite symptomatic, uh, in, in my view. So uh, what we have seen th this week is basically uh, a very abrupt uh, turnaround in the management of the pandemic. The, the, the authorities have uh, uh, announced 10 measures to uh, relax uh, uh, COVID discipline uh, uh, and have decided to uh, shift uh, the resources from uh, massive testing and uh, massive quarantining and, and ghastly facilities towards uh, vaccination, particularly of, of the elderly, uh, and uh, towards uh, support to, to those who are henceforth allowed to confine at home. Uh, so this, this is uh, heartening. Uh, it will uh, be tested, though, because we have reports uh, yesterday in Beijing that the uh, uh, treatments are in short supply to uh, cope with, with the surge in cases that, that are now appearing, uh, even though uh, uh, the, the number of cases is widely understated because they've stopped testing so, or, or, or they, they, smu they test much less. So th there, there will be a, a difficult uh, transition towards living with COVID uh, in, in China. Um, now, going back to, to the convergence process I, I started with, uh, I think something has, has changed in recent years. It was alluded to uh, by my neighbor, uh, uh, Jean-Marie Pogam, uh, talking about deglobalization and fragmentation or, or the absence thereof. But in, in the numbers, indeed, if we look at the, the share of uh, foreign trade divided by GDP in China, uh, this share has declined very substantially over the past 15 years or so. And uh, this reflects uh, several things. One is simply that China is becoming a much bigger economy. So it's normal that it would uh, uh, be uh, less, less open on, on this measure. Uh, but also there are other uh, factors. One is the, China, the Made in China 2025 strategy that was alluded to by Jean-Marie as well. It dates back to the mid-2010s, uh, whereby uh, China seeks to uh, reduce its dependence on foreign technology. Then there's the Trump uh, war uh, uh, in 2018 and onwards with the tit-for-tat uh, uh, tariffs. Uh, then there's the U.S. Chips uh, and Science Act, the EU Chips Act, um, and the U.S. Inflation Reduction Act as well. That all go in the same direction of uh, uh, bringing security concerns into uh, uh, economics and, and uh, 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 cl cl trying to French shore or to home shore uh, activities. So uh, a more inward-looking perspective on, on globalization. At the same time, there's less FDI uh, in China, and the foreign firms operating in China are either exiting for some of them or decoupling their activities in China from those uh, elsewhere. Now, the, the, the Belt and Road Initiative was mentioned, or the new Silk Roads, uh, and this is also a good illustration of how China's clout uh, has, has been uh, at the same time very impressive and has uh, shown uh, limits. A number of uh, countries, uh, recipient countries, are now stuck with infrastructure that is uh, only half functional uh, uh, and with debt, uh, uh, significant debt, opaque debt uh, to Chinese uh, lenders. So th there, there is a, a problem there. And then uh, on climate change, uh, to, to wrap up, uh, uh, perhaps uh, the, the most important issue, uh, China is by, by far the largest emitter of greenhouse gases uh, in the world, twice as much as the U.S., of course, in per capita terms, it's still half as much as the U.S., but the U.S. is not very virtuous, so it, 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 it's, it's really bad. And China uh, has long recognized that this challenge, if only because you cannot breathe in Beijing. Uh, <laughs> the smog is so, 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 so bad. So they're well aware, and in their successive five-year plans, they have set out uh, ambitions to uh, reduce uh, emissions. 
Uh, and in some ways, they've played a very important role. I think of uh, solar panels, for example, is because China has stepped up uh, the production uh, of those that we have seen a dramatic decline in the price of renewables, which will definitely uh, uh, be part of the solution uh, for, for climate change. But uh, in parallel, China continues to be uh, over-reliant on coal on a massive scale. Uh, they have promised to stop building uh, uh, coal-fired plants abroad. But uh, since that promise in 2021, uh, 14 more such plants have uh, started operations. And at home, they continue to build at a frantic pace. Uh, so uh, there is a clearly a, a problem here uh, with, with how China is going to achieve its uh, uh, commitment to uh, have peak carbon by 2030 and to have uh, carbon neutrality by 2060. And how, more importantly, the world at large uh, Will, will reach its climate goals. So uh, for China, a part of the solution is to move away from a model that's highly dependent on uh, real estate. Uh, real estate uh, is uh, in very intensive in cement and uh, steel. Uh, it's uh, not compatible with a low carbon uh, model. Uh, and financially, it's also proven to be uh, uh, unsustainable. Uh, and uh, China has this long-standing goal of uh, giving more weight to consumption. Uh, this, th this would help moving further towards services and, and away from, from heavy industry. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Vincent. Okay, we actually have 20 minutes still left. And so I'd like to open it up and see if there are questions or comments people would like to make from the floor. And if they could, if you could respect the same punctuality that the panelists have done, we'll get many of you in. Who would like to lead off? So I have a colleague in the first row over there. I think somebody should be walking around with microphones. So okay. If not, there's another question over there. There's one there, you see? Yeah. I don't see. There's there's somebody coming over with a microphone now. If not, let's. Just share one of the microphones from the panel here to make sure that you get heard. There we go. C'est bon, c'est bon. There's a panel. They, they, they they yeah, one. Okay. Thank you. It was very interesting. I'm, I w I'm, uh, my question is to all of you. The stock markets have fell down very drastically all over the world. I'm interested to see what you think about the future of the stock market and more than that, what will be the future of the cryptocurrencies? Because it seems to be that it is diminished totally from the system. Okay, investment advice. Now, uh, something over the back there, I think. A microphone, yep, right in the back, middle, there. Yeah. Hmm? I don't see that there, yep. Je vais parler, uh, oui, voilà. Je vais parler en français, Je vous en prie, si vous permettez. Cette, les analyses qui sont très intéressantes sur la fragmentation semblent rattacher celle-ci au découplage économique et politique et souvent lié à ce qui se passe maintenant, à la guerre d'Ukraine. Il me semble que les bases de cette fragmentation ont commencé au début du siècle. Certes, en 2001, la Chine est devenue membre de l'OMC, source d'interdépendance, mais en même temps, elle a créé avec la Russie l'organisation de coopération de Shanghai, qui s'est élargie maintenant et qui est peut-être une base de nouveaux non-alignement. Et puis il y a eu la crise 2008 avec la montée du G20 qui se substitue au G7 souvent, et puis le BRIC. Et puis ce qui se passe maintenant. Ce qui se passe maintenant, c'est essentiellement, me semble-t-il, un développement d'un multi-annihilement. Et je vous propose, je vous demande de penser à ce qui se passe ici, dans la région. Le voyage du président chinois en Arabie Saoudite et au Golfe, son sens et ses conséquences 
sur la fragmentation. Merci beaucoup. Je crois que there is also uh, Mr. Sabrina over there, just sitting over there. Yeah. Who's and then then we come to the lady in the front row after that. Yeah. And the, Merci de ce panel passionnant. Il y a un point que vous n'avez pas abordé et qui est le sujet de la migration, des migrations. Et je serais très intéressé par savoir comment, dans votre perception, cette question des migrations joue dans la coopération ou l'absence de coopération internationale, son impact sur les, la géopolitique actuelle euh, comme sur l'organisation internationale. C'est un phénomène qui affecte la planète entière, euh, l'Amérique euh, comme euh, l'Europe. C'est un sujet fondamental pour cette région. Comment joue-t-elle dans votre vision euh, du paysage global Merci, Jean-Michel. Et puis, il y a une femme en front, right here. Merci beaucoup pour tous les panélistes. J'ai mostly un comment. And it's a comment on what Madame Tumi said. Uh, she said, how come Africa has 57 countries and they don't even have one seat on the UN Security Council? So don't you think like the whole world order, starting from the Bretton Woods, it like, you know, with the IMF world, uh, WTO, the whole system, the world system, had favored the West, the developing countries on the expense, uh, the. Developed, the developed, countries. developed countries on the expense of the developing countries, which basically somehow hinders their development. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And then there's the gentleman just behind her, and then one before, and then I come to the panel after that. I think. Yeah. Thank you very much. Au euh, et les défis et distorsions entre le nord et le sud, l'est et l'ouest, pensez-vous que les organisations internationales et les institutions des Nations Unies, telles que le IMF, sont encore capables de répondre à ces défis ou nécessitent une réforme Merci. Merci. And I think there was a gentleman just behind, and then we'll close. Okay, voila. We've gone from zero to two mics. Yeah, thank you very much. In line with that question, there was quite some controversy this summer about the president of the World Bank being called a climate denier. Do you think more broadly that uh, the international organization should be reformed in order to put climate change more at the center of their, their action? Thank you very much. Okay, very pertinent. Thierry, did you have a question? Yeah. Voila. No, uh, after the remark of Monsieur Wallalou a few minutes ago, I would like to say, to confirm that uh, Prince uh, Faisal uh, Al Saud, who, that is the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Saudi Arabia, will be with us uh, on uh, Sunday uh, afternoon. And uh, I think that will give us an opportunity to discuss uh, the foreign policy of uh, Saudi Arabia. That's Thank you so much for mentioning that. I think there's one final comment over there, and then we come to the panel. Yeah. Euh, je vais le faire en français. Euh, Bertrand Badré euh, a cité Candide. Euh, Est-ce que Bertrand, tu ne penses pas que malheureusement euh, nous sommes dans un monde où chacun cultive son jardin, mais de manière très différente. À l'époque de Voltaire, on voyait disparaître les jardins à la française pour se développer les jardins à l'anglaise. Euh, Aujourd'hui, il y a quand même pas mal de meurtres dans des jardins anglais. Donc je, je suis un tout petit peu inquiet, parce que je, je suis bien d'accord, chacun cultive son jardin, mais chacun a une vision du jardin de l'autre différente de la sienne. Et ça, c'est quand même une certaine forme de démondialisation, y compris de nos valeurs. They would like to answer. There's uh, investment advice and stock markets and crypto to start with. There's the issue of migration. There's whether the world system itself has been designed in a way that 
you could put it slightly differently to say, you know, does it take into account the, the needs and interests of, of developing countries? Uh, do the international institutions have to be, uh, in some ways, r renewed to focus more on climate change? And what about this issue of globalization, deglobalization? So, Madame Touré, peut-être qu'on va continuer dans le même, with the same uh, order? Yes. Uh, well, I mean, about the, the system. Uh, obviously, uh, if we go back to uh, 1948, uh, when we were designing uh, even the UN system and uh, the cooperation uh, organization, most of the African countries and Asian countries were under colonization. And we are carrying, uh, you know, all these bags since then. And obviously, they are not fit that's the least we could say about it, and they need to be reformed. And the first reform is starting by giving a permanent seat to Africa. I think African countries have been uh, consistent with that. Um, it's very interesting how when we start talking about globalization, China invites itself as a main topic. <laughs> I mean, that's a pattern I observed everywhere, uh, which speaks to how powerful they are, whether we like it or not, um, which doesn't matter to them anyway. Uh, but what we have to see is that from where I'm sitting again, Africa, we are saying, well, this is a model that we need to have. Because as you pointed out, uh, drastically over 40 to 30 years, poverty went down at a rate never seen before in history. Um, this is now a powerhouse in the international scene. So why don't we do that? And I think it, you know, our traditional partners have to be very aware that uh, for African leaders, China is, remain, is going to remain as a key player. Of course, there is no free money, but there's never been free money dealing with the West, neither, on the contrary. So I think um, if we would like to sort of keep uh, businessing together, we better pay attention to uh, what is going on in the relationship between China and, uh, and the rest of the world and Africa, which is a mineral-rich continent, and it's going to be the same for a long time. So I think the question is posed to OCD countries and to other uh, international partners who want to make money in Africa. Second, uh, the, the, the issue about um, migration, uh, which is part also of the you know, the, 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 the struggle we are having with, <laughs> with Europe, mostly. Um, I was reading yesterday that um, there is a dire lack of, 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 of you know, um, I mean, people are having jobs, but they are not seeing people to take the jobs. <laughs> There's a lack uh, of, uh, of workers, obviously. Um, but yet, you do have unfit uh, migration regulation which is more of a sort of psychological barrier than you know, a, a, a making sense <laughs> decision. Europe needs young workers, obviously, but of, of a certain type, according to voters. Do you want them to look like European? But it's not going to be the case, because Europe is a very old continent. And as you know, the, the, the only uh, you know, um, uh, workers you can get mostly will be from places that don't look like <laughs> European. So that is also something that we need to, Europe need to deal with. I think Europe reminds me of, you know, old castles, um, you know, that used to have their times uh, and who refuse now to see that, I mean, the foundation are aging and you need to maybe do some maintenance. Um, so I think um, this uh, type of uh, forum help us to, to move forward okay. because we have to go to the bottom line of the issue if you want to find solutions. I think there is a way for good cooperation on a win-win basis. Um, the lady who raised the issues is, is the same. In Africa, you are having now strong movement of youth. Uh, mind you, 70% of the population is below the age of 35. So talking to them about the past is not relevant. What they want to see is solution now. And if we really would like to build healthy relationship um, and somehow, because that's, that's the issue of uh, OECD countries contain, uh, mean, meaning the expansion of, of China, it, it's to redefine the way we do business. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, let's take two minutes each, please. So, Shami. 
Thank you. On the um, stock market, we are more concerned about the consequences than the, the causes at the WTO. Consequences could be uh, financial crisis in developing countries, which are already struggling with their food bills, which are very high because of the inflation. Sur la question de la, de la fragmentation euh, et de la Chine posée par M. Wallalou, bon, d'abord, la Chine ne cherche pas du tout en matière commerciale des alternatives au système multilatéral existant. Au contraire, elle, elle aime beaucoup l'OMC, elle a des intérêts dedans. Elle a d'ailleurs euh, offert à l'OMC un jardin chinois qui est à l'entrée, qui est très beau, qui montre une certaine intention de rester dans l'institution. Euh, ce qui est intéressant pour comprendre la, 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 la dynamique, c'est de regarder la, la guerre commerciale Chine-États-Unis. Euh, on a une, une première étude qui n'est pas de l'OMC, qui est du Peterson Institute, mais qui dit qu'en gros, euh, un, cette guerre commerciale n'a pas conduit à un découplage entre la Chine et les, les états unis le commerce a continué à progresser, et deux, cette guerre commerciale a produit exactement les effets qui étaient ceux qui étaient visés, c'est-à-dire sur les produits euh, visés par les sanctions, euh, par les tarifs américains, il y a eu une réduction sérieuse du commerce, souvent des produits intermédiaires, des produits de technologie, et sur les produits qui n'étaient pas visés, il y a eu, comme par exemple les consoles de jeux, pour les, pour, pour les jeunes américains, parce que là, ça posait des problèmes politiques, euh, pour ceux des produits qui n'étaient pas visés, il y a eu une augmentation du, du, du commerce. Et je pense que la globalisation du futur va avoir quelque chose à voir avec ça, des, des choses plus complexes, plus sélectives, sur les produits de haute technologie, sur les produits euh, de type semi-conducteur, euh, voiture électrique, etc. On va voir de la fragmentation, mais pas nécessairement sur le, le, le panorama global. Sur la question de l'immigration, chez, chez nous, dans le commerce, elle se traduit par la question des mouvements de personnes physiques dans, le, dans, les, dans, dans les services. Et là, on tombe sur ce que Aminata a dit, c'est-à-dire l'opposition, ou, ou Bertrand, euh, ouest-sud, c'est-à-dire que dans l'héritage des règles, c'est un secteur qui est moins libéralisé que celui des biens, euh, et s'il fait partie des asymétries euh, qui compliquent beaucoup les négociations, parce que les, les pays qui ont un intérêt à l'exportation de ces prestations de services par la, par la main d'œuvre, considère qu'il faut d'abord remettre à niveau avant de faire d'autres libéralisations dans les autres secteurs. Donc on a, on, on a ça. And last on the question uh, about Africa and global governance. I think uh, in the WTO we see Africa claiming its voice more and more. Uh, of course, uh, our leader is an African, uh, which is not uh, by accident, it means something. Uh, second, Africa is uh, more and more invested in the negotiation. I'll just take one example, is our dispute settlement system, which has been weakened by the, um, by the US. Uh, Africa is pleading for its restoration. And what is really interesting is that Africa was not a user of the dispute settlement system. There are very minimal cases where Africa has been involved in a, in a trade dispute. So that means Africa is interested in having the non-discrimination principle being enforced in the WTO uh, in the future. Thank, Thank you very much. Vincent, I just come down. The Thank you. So uh, I'll take the stock price uh, and crypto question and uh, the migration one uh, just briefly. So uh, the fact that stock prices uh, have suffered is, is no surprise with interest rates moving up and bound to move up further uh, after years and years of negative interest rates or, or free money. There was a, a, an asset bubble, uh, clearly, and it's now popping. Uh, on crypto and, and its collapse, uh, I think this illustrates the need to regulate crypto and more generally uh, the shadow banking uh, sector uh, more carefully because uh, uh, th th those developments can have systemic uh, consequences. Uh, on migration, uh, I think it's interesting to uh, see the differences between OECD countries. Uh, some countries have uh, welcomed m migrants with open arms on, on a big scale, for example, Sweden. Um, others are more reluctant, uh, Korea, Japan, traditionally, but even in Korea and Japan, where they tend to prefer uh, robots to, to immigrants, they are now uh, employing more and more uh, immigrants. Uh, it, it's not necessarily an open policy in Japan, for example, but it, it is clearly a, a trend from a very low base, but it, it's moving up. Thank you very much, Vincent. Okay. Kim. Yeah, I need to talk about very briefly about the China. I mean, China has contributed to the, the world economy, I mean, after the joining the WTO. And China exported the, 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 the disinflation, deflation, or price stability to the world uh, for, the, for the last two decades, and also create the market as well. So uh, there is a good aspects of the China. Uh, but um, now I think that, that the world is now in the page of the, uh, the aftermath of the global financial crisis still. So for more than 15 years, I mean, we are now suffering from the, uh, the aftermath of the global financial crisis and also cheap money as well. And so all of these kind of things, I mean, and also the, the, the relations between the Saudi Arabia and the United States are now, now the, uh, 
because of the necessity of the cooperation between the two countries in terms of the natural resources and oil, then I think that um, the Saudi Arabia would be more independent from the, uh, the, uh, the Western countries. And then and the BRICS, all the BRICS countries are now very, very welcome the, uh, the application of the Saudi Arabia joining the, the BRICS. Uh, BRICS, uh, uh, BRICS. So, and the, in, in, in June, we had the, the G7 and we had the, you know, the NATO summit, but um, uh, don't forget that um, there was a very big and this, uh, the gatherings of the BRICS summit uh, countries. So Indian Prime Minister Modi was very busy uh, to participate in the, uh, the BRICS summit and followed by the G7. So, so, so another big, big world is now the moving, moving the without the, the uh, noticing, uh, the, our noticing of the, the what's going on. And the last one is about the, the international, the reformation of the international organization. I think that um, now the international organization has, has played a very good role, but um, now I think that it's time to think, really think about the, the reform of the, the organization, international organizations, especially United Nations and Security Council and other, uh, some, of course, I mean, trade uh, order as well. And because, and the cryptocurrency and the many other issues uh, now we are now uh, talking about them, the main problem is that uh, we have no global governance. We have no uh, global regulations uh, uh, to cover the, all these kind of the, the rules. So that's the one of the main reasons why the, we cannot uh, f uh, speed, uh, we cannot fix the, all these problems. I mean, that's speedy. Okay. Thank you very much. Chef. Yes, on, on, on equities and crypto, but we, we had very, very low and negative real interest rates, so we had bubbles in other asset markets, and now interest rates are rising, so those bubbles are all bursting, and that will continue for the foreseeable future. And, and in my view, most of those bubbles should burst, and it's a positive development. Uh, quant à l'immigration, je dirais que le paradoxe est que les pays qui ont plus besoin uh, de l'immigration du point de vue économique sont uh, les pays qui, qui plus le, le résistent pour motifs, pour raisons politiques, ça ne changera pas. Uh, ce sont des, des réalités politiques, et quoi que soit le, les nécessités économiques. And that brings me to a general principle. I'm an academic. I deal in uh, what, whys and what's, not shoulds. That is, why does the world look the way it does? What is the way that the world looks? Whatever our shoulds may be, I think it's important to have that in mind. And that get, brings me to this point about the, the Bretton Woods or post-war institutions and the possibilities of other institutions. Sure, the, the post-World War II and the, the reigning international economic institutions definitely obey the golden rule. The golden rule is the people who have the gold get to make the rules, and there's no surprising surprise that those who made the rules in the post-war period made rules that favor them. Um, alternative options, the countries that were successful have been successful. We're not successful because of the non-aligned movement. The non-aligned movement in the, pr the previous non-aligned movement had no impact on development strategies, no positive impact on development strategies. The countries that were successful, the ones that played by the rules, whether it was Korea, China, or others, and that's going to continue, the creation of a new axis, whether it's Russo-Chinese or some other form, is not going to happen, not in the foreseeable future, because as I said, and as others have, have also ex echoed, the OECD is not the only game in town, but it is the only realistically significant game in town for developing countries. That's the reality. The reality may be unpleasant, but it is the reality, and it's the reality that developing countries are going to have to live with. Thank you. Bertrand. Merci, Massoud. Je vais parler en, en, en français sur, sur les cryptos et les, et les marchés. Je n'ai pas beaucoup de commentaires. Je rappellerai juste que Warren Buffett avait dit en 2008, peut-être certains s'en souviennent, c'est quand la marée baisse qu'on voit qu'il se baigne sans maillot. Et euh, j'ajoutais perfidement à l'époque, on a découvert qu'on était dans un camp de naturistes. Il n'y avait pas beaucoup de maillots. Et, et aujourd'hui, on voit bien, on l'a vu euh, en Grande-Bretagne, au, au moment du mini-budget de Liz Truss, on a découvert que les fonds de pension anglais étaient plus fragiles dans leur structuration qu'on ne le croyait. On le voit aujourd'hui sur les cryptos. Il y en aura d'autres. On, on va découvrir des tas de choses sous l'eau qui ne sont pas très plaisantes et ça ne va pas être extrêmement agréable. Sur les organisations internationales, euh, moi je, enfin, on a dit beaucoup de choses et encore une fois, leur réforme, elle est à la fois souhaitable et difficile à envisager compte tenu de tous les blocages. Il y a quelque chose qui me paraît très important aujourd'hui. Euh, on a parlé de, 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 du dirigeant de la Banque mondiale. Je pense que toutes les organisations internationales devraient être 100% compatibles Sustainable Development Goals et 100% compatibles Climat. Point barre. On ne commence pas à dire je fais 35%, je fais 42%. Je fais... Non, à un moment, il faut arrêter. La planète s'est donnée une feuille de route. Les organisations internationales suivent la feuille de route, qu'elles l'aiment ou qu'elles ne l'aiment pas. Point. Et là, il faut être absolument 
absolument clair. Sur l'immigration, Jean-Michel l'a souligné, je, je l'avais dit un peu, je pense qu'on on, on risque d'être dans un monde assez effrayant. C'est-à-dire que d'un côté, on se replie, comme je le disais, sur son jardin, euh, le French Shoring, comme disait Janet Yellen, on, 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 on va rapatrier un certain nombre de choses. Pour un certain nombre de raisons, on va limiter une partie du commerce. Et Jean-Marie, moi, je, je commence à voir dans mes investissements, des gens me disent, tu ne peux pas investir là, puisque les produits sont exportés en avion, ça émet du carbone, et donc ce n'est pas bon dans les normes européennes. On va avoir des effets de bord qui vont qu'on va rétrécir tout ça. En face de ça, on a un défi démographique immense, Amina Tatouré l'a rappelé. Euh, Comment est-ce qu'on est qu traite ça Si, si on, on se replie sur soi et qu'on n'offre pas de perspective au pays où la démographie explose, euh, et que par ailleurs on ne veut pas de migration chez soi, il y a un moment où on ne va pas square the circle. Comment on va y arriver Je ne sais pas. Mais si on ne trouve pas une réponse dans les 5 à 15 ans à cette question, nous avons un monde effrayant devant nous. Je, 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 pèse, je pèse ce mot. Et, et sur la question de, 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 de Philippe Chalmin, euh, oui, il y a plein de jardins, chacun voit son jardin. C'est d'ailleurs le principe du jardin avec les, 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 les palissades, c'est que chacun fait son petit jardin en espérant que la somme de tous les jardins fera quelque chose de formidable. C'est possible, c'est peu vraisemblable. Encore une fois, il y a, il y a, il y a une différence d'échelle entre son jardin individuel et la planète, euh, le jardin d'Éden d'une certaine manière. Et donc, comment, sous le contrôle de Monsieur le rabbin, euh, comment est-ce comment est qu'on organise ce, ce, ce lien entre notre jardin individuel et ce jardin planétaire, euh, je pense que là aussi, si on ne veut pas de ce monde effrayant dont je parlais, il est absolument urgent de tous devenir euh, jardiniers euh, à la française, à la chinoise, euh, à la japonaise, à l'anglaise, tout ce qu'on veut, mais avec cette vision collective indispensable. Merci beaucoup, Bertrand. So, uh, I think we've come to the end of our panel, and uh, I, I'm not going to try to summarize uh, anything, but I just say one thing, which is. I think the, what is very clear from this conversation is that there are going to be some really difficult issues to resolve, that are genuine difficult questions with trade-offs that are not easy to sort out. But in that conversation, we should at least attempt not to do, create problems that don't need to exist. And I, I just picked two that were identified One is the question of, of natural gas and its use in Africa. It's an obstacle to a meaningful conversation now because the approach that many countries have taken to the use and development of natural gas in Africa is incoherent with their own policies on the use of natural gas. And by insisting that Africa should find a future energy needs when the majority of people in Africa do not have an energy access uh, at the right level without relying on natural gas while Europe and US should continue to, to draw upon it just creates an unnecessary uh, aggravation in, in an already difficult conversation. And the, the second example I think is, is to, be, to assume that everybody shares the preoccupation and perspective that, say, you have in the U.S. about China today. I mean, we, I sit in the U.S., and we may be preoccupied with the, the impact of a growing China in the world and what that means, but to assume that every other country is equally preoccupied with that and shares the perspective that you have in the U.S. makes it harder to have a conversation. So I think you were saying in the final comment, uh, uh, Madame Touré said that You know, we should not assume and we should start from the recognition that other countries don't have the same perspectives. An honest conversation would help us to go quickly to the difficult problems that we actually will have to resolve with a great deal of discussion. So I think this has been a terrific panel. I want to ask you to please join me in thanking them for their contribution. And, and I think we go directly to the next panel, which is the breakdown of the global economic order, the appropriate next item. <laughs>